Let's get to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Now, this moment might have also felt like a gaffe, like an unexpected circumstance. But President Biden says he stands by what he said on Saturday. The president said that Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, cannot stay in power. And that kind of sounded like he was calling for regime change. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Now, soon the administration tried to walk that last sentence back. Moments after the speech, the White House insisted that the president was not calling for regime change. Yesterday, Democrats and U.S. officials reiterated that. We do not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. Let me be clear and just state right off the bat that the U.S. does not have a policy of regime change towards Russia. I think the White House has uh, been clear. They have been disciplined and they've said we need a negotiated end to this war. That has to be with Putin uh, as a settlement. It's not the policy of regime change. Today, the president also reiterated that he was not calling for Putin's removal. He claims that was not policy, just his perspective. And I'm not walking anything back. The fact of the matter is, I was expressing the more outrage I felt toward the way Putin is dealing and the actions of this man, just, just brutality. Half the children in Ukraine, I had just come from being with those families. And, uh, and so, uh, but I want to make it clear, I wasn't then, nor am I now, articulating a policy change. As for the war, Russia's invasion appears to be struggling. Ukrainian officials say that Russia wants to split the country in two, kind of like North and South Korea. Meanwhile, the first face-to-face -face peace talks in weeks are set to take place tomorrow in Turkey, and the idea is to arrange a ceasefire. But President Zelensky says he has no interest in trading people, land, or sovereignty to get this done. Let's begin tonight with NBC's Ali Aruzi, who joins us from the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. Ali, what are the implications of President Biden's statements in Ukraine, where you are, and across the border uh, in evening, Poland? Joshua. What kind of reaction are those getting? Hi, good evening, Joshua. Well, I mean, it was a very strong speech. Uh, it was a confrontational speech, but it was also measured until we almost got to the goodbyes and thank yous, where at that time he seemed to be calling for regime change and cue the fireworks. There was outrage in Moscow and people in the United States also criticized them, saying that he had made a dangerous situation even more dangerous. He'd made an unpredictable situation even more unpredictable. And it's it's not hard to see why uh, the president sort of went off script and said those things. He'd been in Poland. He'd seen what these Ukrainian refugees have uh, been suffering in Ukraine and fleeing the war-torn east and those horror stories that we've seen out of Mariupol and so many other places. But of course, when the president of the United States speaks, it has serious implications, especially when it's not U.S. policy. And that's why we saw, like in your introduction, that uh, they were trying to re-clarify what the president said, that he wasn't calling for regime change and that he was just saying that Putin can't exert that sort of power uh, in, in the region and amongst his uh, neighbors. But I've got to tell you, the speech went down pretty well here with Ukrainians. That's the sort of thing that they do like to hear. They would like to see, obviously, Vladimir Putin uh, removed from power because their country has been under immense pressure. Uh, cities have been destroyed. The economy is is in tatters here. So that's the sort of stuff they like to hear. And in fact, you speak to Ukrainians here, they wanted more from the president. They wanted to hear stuff like, you know, close the skies, give us the S-300 defense system, sell us tanks if you're not going to give it to us. Um, but of course, in Moscow as well, it drew a big uh, rebuke from the Kremlin spokesman, uh, Peskov. You know, he said that this was a direct insult to Vladimir Putin. It shows uh, that the United States is trying to meddle in Russian affairs, and that's something that they shouldn't be doing. And it also feeds into the narrative of Russian state media that the U.S. has sights on Russia, that they want to change uh, the leadership there. And obviously the U.S. is saying that's not true, but that is uh, cannon fodder for uh, the, the, the Russians. They will use that against the Americans, saying, look, you know, they have their sights on us. 
and this is evidence for you. So that will probably get played out a lot in Russian media. Before I have to let you go, uh, Ali, do people still feel safe in Lviv? We know that people were fleeing Kyiv to get west, possibly on their way to Poland. There have been assessments from other nations that the Russian uh, invasion seems to have slowed down or hit some, some bumps along the road. But do people in Lviv still feel safe, generally speaking? Um, well, Lviv has always been a safe zone since the beginning of this war for those waves and waves of displaced of people. And all the people you speak to here feel lucky that they're here in Lviv, even though that, you know, their homes may have been destroyed in the east, their families have been separated, they have to have sent their children abroad. But certainly that attack over the weekend with long range precision missiles from the sea on that fuel depot uh, shook this place. I wouldn't say the peace here is shattered. But uh, the sense of security has been punctured. We spoke to one young lady. Um, she had come back from Poland two days before those missile strikes, thinking Lviv was now a safer place again. Once those missile strike strikes took place, uh, she said she's going back to Poland tomorrow. It was just too much of a risk for her to stay here. And she said that because she said Vladimir Putin is capable of anything. He bombs children's hospitals, churches, uh, apartment buildings. So Lviv might be hit as well. Uh, but, you know, also to your point, they're fighting hard, the Ukrainians on the Eastern Front, to keep this place safe, to keep those supply lines flowing to the east of the country. And you speak to Ukrainians here, they say it's impossible to split this country. We are all very unified people, uh, and that's not something Vladimir Putin is going to be achieving. You see his sort of botched attempt to, to, to invade this country is not going to plan in the east. He's being pushed out of many areas that they've already uh, taken at the beginning of the war. To divide this country, you would have to conquer it and then control it. He hasn't been able to con conquer the east. He has not in control of any of the major cities. Ukraine holds on to much of its territory. And you see the places that uh, the Russians are in control of or partially in control of. They're seeing demonstrations there from teenagers all the way to, to grandparents. So it's going to be right. very hard to split this country given the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Thank you, Ali. Please do stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ali Aruzi in Lviv starting us off tonight. Let's continue now with John Herbst, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. He's the senior director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Ambassador Herbst, welcome back. Good to see you again. My pleasure. Can we start with what President Zelensky said in terms of a possible way to wind this war down, this neutral status that he says he's going to entertain. That sounds kind of like give, uh, conceding or acceding to one of Vladimir Putin's demands, which is that Ukraine not become part of any of the European alliances that President Putin is so concerned about. Uh, Dmitry Peskov, who's a Kremlin spokesman, gave an interview to the PBS NewsHour today, and just looking at a rough transcript, he said that the NATO machine is, in his words, not a machine of security, it's a machine of confrontation. So does President Zelensky's offer take the prospect of that confrontation off the table? It certainly does, but it's well shy of the maximalist demands that still remain the Russian position. Because the only Russian decision maker is Putin. And Putin has suggested zero flexibility so far. He doesn't want just neutrality. He wants Ukraine to be demilitarized, and he would not accept the notion of guarantees from other states for Ukraine security because Putin wants to control the country. I'd like your take on what the president said, these comments that had to kind of be massaged after he made them. Uh, NBC's White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell asked him about those, and here is how he responded. Do you believe what you said, that Putin can't remain in power? Or do you now regret saying that? I was expressing the moral outrage that I feel, and I make no apologies for it. Does it complicate the diplomacy of this moment? No, I don't think it does. Ambassador, what do you make of the comments and the impact they will have? Okay, it was certainly a mistake, and that's why the White House walked it back, even the president does not want to admit it. But it, it shows a certain unsteadiness in his policy. He's laid out a sound framework for dealing with Kremlin aggression, meaning arming Ukraine, sanctioning Russia, and strengthening NATO along Russia's borders. But he's done that very, very slowly, cautiously, and timidly. And he has not provided nearly enough arms to Ukraine, because he says the Russians may see that as escalatory, which is frankly a sign of weakness. 
What he said yesterday was, in fact, far more provocative to the Russians than any weapon system he's denied to the Ukrainians. So he's done it backwards. He should be quiet about what he thinks of Putin and be active in sending the arms to Ukraine to help Ukraine defeat the Russians on the battlefield. Let's get to a few of uh, our audience's questions about where things stand. Joseph emailed us about the future of Ukraine. Joseph writes, if Ukraine prevails and Russia still takes half, who's to say Putin won't continue in a later time after the West helps rebuild Ukraine? Joseph, thank you for that question. And Ambassador, I think that kind of gets to the concern we've heard from a number of Western European leaders from some of the Baltic states that Putin may say that, oh, they'll just take this piece, but he's never going to stop with just a piece. Well, I think Joseph's right. If Putin were able to take half of Ukraine, he would certainly come back for more. And if he comes back for more of Ukraine, he would also come back for more in the form of our NATO allies, especially in the Baltics, but also perhaps Poland, about which they've been fulminating for the last month. Uh, but I don't think Putin can grab half of Ukraine. He's having trouble take, holding on to the, what, looking at the map, it's maybe a quarter of Ukraine, a little bit less than a quarter of Ukraine. He doesn't even have that firmly. So the Ukrainians are fighting, they're fighting hard, they're fighting for their freedom, they're fighting for their sovereignty, they're fighting for their territory. And they are fighting smartly, whereas Russian troops have no interest in this fight. This is Putin's war and Putin's war alone against the Ukrainian people. He cannot win this war or even take half or a quarter of the country without facing major, major problems. We keep getting questions about NATO, understandably, including what NATO's options may be in this, or, excuse me, <clears throat> in this circumstance. Here is what Deborah and Ben left in our inbox. Listen. I understand that NATO can only do so much since the Ukraine is not a part of NATO. But it was my understanding that they want to join NATO. Why not let them join? It to me like NATO could pass a humanitarian uh, mission. I don't think there's anything in NATO's laws that says they cannot uh, adopt resolutions collectively to uh, defend a non-NATO territory. Ben, Deborah, we appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Ambassador, what would you say to them? Look, I agree with both Ben and Deborah. Point of fact, um, NATO could admit Ukraine. It's not going to happen in the near future because a good number of NATO allies do not want it to happen. But we could, NATO could open a humanitarian mission to Ukraine. We've done this, we did this in Georgia when Moscow, actually we took an American humanitarian mission to Georgia by American military aircraft and American Navy ships to deliver humanitarian aid. But the Biden administration has taken that off the table in fear that Russia would consider it escalatory. That's the kind of timidity that's not actually very good to defend American interests or to protect Ukrainian civilians who are dying by the thousands. The polls suggested establishing a humanitarian zone in western, western Ukraine. But that went nowhere at the summit. The White House was not interested, and many NATO allies were not interested. Ambassador John Herbst, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, we're always glad to have you help answer some of these questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Many of you have been sending wonderful questions about what's happening in Ukraine. Please keep them coming. We want to hear more of your questions and thoughts. Sherry asked a great question about boots on the ground. Maybe we'll get to that another night. But send your questions in as well. We're at, now to, at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us now tonight at NBCnews.com. Still to come, is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? Will he and his generals be punished for war crimes? We'll explain what a war crime actually is and what it would take to press charges. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. What would it take to hold Vladimir Putin accountable for his invasion of Ukraine and all the devastation it's caused? Some are calling him a war criminal, and some of you have questions about what that really means. Here's what Joe from Wisconsin asked us. Who's going to arrest Putin for these war crimes? And isn't invading another country a war crime in itself? Good questions, Joe. Thank you for those. Defining a war crime is pretty straightforward. But prosecuting one can be very complicated. 
Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. What we have seen already uh, from Vladimir Putin's regime in the use of the munitions that they have already been uh, been dropping on as, on innocent civilians, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in my view, already fully qualifies as, as as a war crime. The world will continue to make Putin accountable for his war crimes. Some world leaders may agree that Vladimir Putin is committing war crimes, but that's not just rhetoric. A war crime is an actual crime. Law professor Rebecca Hamilton spent two years at the International Criminal Court's Prosecution Division. So a war crime can be any number of actions, like um, killing, like torture, horrible crimes. Um, what is characteristic about many of the war crimes that we're seeing in this particular conflict is that it is targeting civilians. So in war, uh, there are laws of war, long-standing laws of war, that say uh, when you are in the midst of a conflict, you can target people who are combatants, who are your enemy, um, but you cannot target people who are civilians. And if you do, um, then you could be responsible for a war crime, a grave breach of the laws of war. Через кожні 5 секунд прилітав і скидував бомби на все, що можна, на всі будинки, дитячі садочки, школи мистецтв, на все. Days after Russia invaded Ukraine, the ICC opened an investigation. War crime prosecutions are one of the court's main duties, involving an extremely thorough process. You have to not only as an investigator show that the horrible acts have been committed, the things that we're all seeing on television right now, the, the bombing of buildings, um, dead bodies, injuries. It's not only a case of, of showing that, but also trying to figure out how do you hold an individual criminally responsible for those actions. And that requires what investigators call linkage evidence between the bad acts that have happened and an individual perpetrator, for example, a leader in the Russian military, um, that they ordered those attacks uh, knowing uh, that there were civilians who would, who would be harmed. The International Criminal Court was established in 1998. Its powers are unique, but limited. Only 17 people have ever been held in its detention center and appeared before the court. Its judges in The Hague have issued 10 convictions and four acquittals. 13 people remain at large. The ICC also does not have its own police force. It relies on other countries to cooperate with making arrests. So what the court does is says, yes, we're going to issue an arrest warrant. And then it is up to states in the world um, to actually execute that arrest warrant. Obviously, the Russian police are not going to arrest Vladimir Putin right now. Um, so he would have to travel to a different country for there to be a police force that would arrest him. The court can still pursue charges with or without an arrest. That might be as far as it goes for Putin. Professor Rebecca Hamilton of American University says others might be more vulnerable. I think the likelihood of charging is extremely high. Uh, a slightly different question is the likelihood of actually seeing them in the dock. And for Putin, that is um, very hard to foresee that in the short term. I think the situation is, is very different for his generals that are in the field in Ukraine. Uh, they, they are at risk of being um, arrested once, once these charges are made. Um, and, you know, regarding Putin, I would say, even though it seems impossible to imagine him on trial right now, historically, we have seen other leaders who seemed all powerful in the moment, who have nonetheless um, ended up facing accountability. Vladimir Putin would not be the first head of state wanted by the court. Back in 2009, the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir. And that was unfortunately a case where even when he did travel and there was an arrest warrant, um, states weren't executing the arrest warrant, which is why he hasn't been transferred to The Hague yet. The Sudanese people themselves ended up overthrowing Omar al-Bashir and putting him in jail inside Sudan. And, you know, the court has been doing other cases, primarily, though, in um, nations in Africa. And so I think it would be a, a big deal and really um, important for the court to show that it can prosecute a case that is taking place in the heart of Europe as well. 
Some critics have said the International Criminal Court focuses too much on Africa. The International Criminal Court is a reflection of what I think is structural racism within the international legal order. It's not that any of the cases that the ICC has prosecuted are not watertight legally in terms of the case that they should be prosecuted at, at the ICC. It's just that there are plenty of other situations of atrocities being happening around the world um, that the ICC hasn't investigated because it hasn't had the cooperation of other states to undertake those investigations. The most powerful states in the international legal system um, work pretty hard to try to avoid accountability on themselves. Most of the world is rallying behind Ukraine, including through resolutions at the United Nations. But it's hard to know what to expect once the ICC investigations are complete. What we're witnessing is an extraordinary moment where things that hadn't seemed possible in terms of the unity um, of condemnation for this illegal act of aggression, it gives me real hope that there is the political will in this particular case to move accountability forward. I don't think we're going to see Putin himself in the dock anytime soon, um, but I think that, that his general should be concerned. Let's get into it further with Jamil Jaffer, founder and executive director at the National Security Institute. He's also a former associate White House counsel to President George W. Bush. Mr. Jaffer, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. So let's break this down in very small, basic pieces. How much does what's happening in Ukraine meet the definition, as you see it, of war crimes? Well, look, I think Professor Hamilton that you just heard from is exactly correct. Um, you know, you can see on television uh, the very clear intentional attacks against civilian targets in uh, Ukraine. We saw it in Mariupol. We saw it in a variety of places, attacks on hospitals, schools, and the like. Um, it's clear that Vladimir Putin is intentionally targeting civilian populations. That's illegal under international humanitarian law, the laws of war, um, and are chargeable as war crimes um, under the Geneva Conventions, either at the International Criminal Court or at another tribunal that the international community sets up like we did in the case of Yugoslavia or in the case of Rwanda. Explain with regard to the Geneva Convention, because, you know, we've heard, we heard one of the questions tonight, and a number of people have asked this, that committing an act of war feels like it should be a war crime in and of itself, but it seems like war crimes in the Geneva Convention, and you know, correct me if I have the wrong understanding of this, it seems like it's written with the understanding that wars are going to happen, and that this is a way to minimize the raw inhumanity, the brutality, the viscerality, the civilian ca collateral damage of wars, even if wars do break out. Is that kind of what war crimes are focused on? No, that, that's exactly correct. So there's a question about what, when, you get, when you're getting into war, what are the rules around whether you can go to war, right? There are times at which wars are appropriate, where you're engaging in self-defense, for example. You're attacked, you respond. You may have engaged in a war, but that's authorized by international law, right? The question then becomes, what are the rules when you're inside a war? Let's say you're in a lawful war. Um, what can you do? And the general theory of the case, right, is that post-World War I and then really post-World War II was the international community came together and said, we're not going to conduct attacks against civilians. We're not going to firebomb Dresden as we did. We're not going to use nuclear weapons. We're not going to attack civilian populations intentionally. And that was sort of the international agreement that had grown up over hundreds of years and in particular were codified in the initial Geneva Conventions in the 1920s and then reiterated and tightened up in the international Geneva, the four Geneva Conventions that were repassed or re-agreed to in the 1940s at the end of World War II. And what those say essentially is that the things like the use of inappropriate weapons, weapons that kill indiscriminately or cause uh, additional harm beyond uh, the, the need of, uh, of, of the nation in war, right, or that target civilians, or the use of things like chemical weapons or biological weapons. Those are prohibited under other international instruments, but at the end of the day, the use of those weaponry, the targeting of civilians or the like, those are all war crimes. That's violations of the laws of war once you're lawfully in a war. Now, Russia has two problems. They're in an illegal war because they didn't have any reason to attack Ukraine that was recognized under international law. And now they're in an illegal war. They're behaving illegally and committing war crimes. So they're, they have two major problems. The ones we're talking about now, though, are these latter ones, the law, violation of laws when you're in a war. 
I empathize with people in our audience who say they're not sure what diplomacy is going to accomplish or what institutions like the ICC can do. I mean, the U.S. formally accused Russia of war crimes in a statement last week. It reads, in part, quote, as with any alleged crime, a court of law with jurisdiction over the crime is ultimately responsible for determining criminal guilt in specific cases, unquote. That's part of a statement from the State Department. But it's not like somebody's going to be able to walk into the Kremlin and put Vladimir Putin behind bars or arrange for him to turn himself in, right? That's just, that's just not going to happen. So what's the best that you would expect to come of the ICC's investigations, prosecutions? Like, what's, what's the high watermark for what we could reasonably expect that to accomplish? Well, I mean, that is one of the challenges of these types of laws, the laws of war in particular, which is that they require some amount of international cooperation, and ultimately they, they require the losing party to have lost and then be subject to international justice when, for example, as President Hamilton pointed out, uh, the party travels or the leader of that country or their generals travel. The problem here, of course, is uh, that Russia has flouted international law in going into Ukraine, and they continue to flout international law by attacking civilians. Part of the challenge is we've made clear to Vladimir Putin, both the United States president and the heads of NATO made clear, we don't intend to intervene militarily in Ukraine, which essentially means it's, it's what I would call a reverse red line, right? Which essentially says we're not going to get involved, so you can do pretty much whatever you want and get away with scot-free right. unless you ultimately lose and we're able to levy justice against you down the road. That's cold comfort, though, for the civilians of Ukraine today who are being targeted by Vladimir Putin's army right now. Jamil Jaffer of the National Security Institute. Appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Did former President Trump break the law in the run-up to January 6th? A federal judge in California weighed in on that today. The case involved one of Donald Trump's attorneys, John Eastman. The judge ruled that Mr. Eastman should hand over more than 100 relevant documents to the House Select Committee that's investigating the attack. But in his ruling, he also wrote that the president's actions were likely criminal. The judge took a closer look at the pressure Mr. Trump put on Vice President Mike Pence to overturn the election. The judge wrote in part, quote, the illegality of the plan was obvious, unquote. Now, to be clear, this was not a criminal ruling. And an attorney for Mr. Eastman says his client plans to turn the documents over. Meanwhile, on Thursday, the committee plans to hear testimony from the former president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. His wife, Ivanka Trump, is reportedly still in discussions with the committee about testifying. Let's break down the latest in the January 6th probe with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. And Danny, let's start with these remarks in the judge's ruling. What impact does that have on the broader investigation, if any? Yeah, on the one hand, none, because this is really a finding by a federal judge. Uh, negating claims of attorney-client privilege. There's a crime fraud exception. If the uh, privilege, the communications with the lawyer, is used to perpetrate a crime or a fraud, then attorney-client privilege disappears. So this is just a finding in a civil case by the judge that, by a preponderance of the evidence, it's more likely than not, essentially, that, uh, that a crime was committed or that, um, that this was a plan and it was obvious to commit uh, criminal conduct. And the judge goes into detail about even though President Trump received uh, advice both ways that he could do this and couldn't do this, the judge says he must have known at some point that this was a bad idea. He could have just filed a lawsuit. He didn't have to do this. So in, in one sense, it has no effect on a criminal finding of responsibility. But in the other sense, if you read the opinion, it provides a handy dandy roadmap to a would-be prosecutor who might want to pursue this. Let's talk about Jared Kushner's role in this testimony. He wasn't subpoenaed by the committee, right? So how does he potentially fit into all of this? If he appears voluntarily, which other folks have done, uh, it's a choice. You know, it's, a, it's really a business decision at the end of the day. Do I fight the inevitability of the subpoena and take the chance uh, that I can ride it out forever? Or in the case of just receiving a letter, uh, you might just say, look, I'm willing to talk. I'll come in. I have nothing to hide. Jared Kushner's interest to the committee, or rather their interest in Jared Kushner, is probably not so much based on any alleged involvement on the day of, but maybe more likely as a receiver of documents, emails, or information 
from people that were involved. So the committee may have interest in him and the fact that he's willing to come and testify without going through a, a lengthy subpoena battle uh, indicates that he's probably taking the approach that, look, I didn't do anything, but if you want to see what other people sent to me, uh, maybe I'll talk about that. Let's back up a little bit to this latest controversy involving Virginia Thomas, Ginny, as she's called, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. There's been reporting in the last few days that she exchanged text messages with the former White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, in which she basically advocated that they continue to fight the results of the 2020 presidential election. Senator Richard Durbin commented on that today in terms of what needs to happen now. Here's part of what he said. It raises a serious question about conflict of interest for Justice Thomas. I mean, to think that he would consider a case where his wife is frequently contacting the chief of staff for the president and giving advice on matters that are going to be ultimately litigated by the court, that is the ultimate conflict of interest. For the good of the court, uh, I think he should recuse himself from those cases. We did speak to senators on both sides of the aisle. Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's also on the Judiciary Committee, said that uh, he is, of course, focused on getting Ketanji Brown-Jackson confirmed, but he did say that the committee should consider some kind of investigation. He also said that Chief Justice Roberts ought to demand a public explanation from Justice Thomas and that he must absolutely recuse himself from cases related to the election. Danny, what's the net effect of this right now? I'm, I'm not sure how much influence anyone really has over this, except for the chief justice. Yeah, when you think about it, if a judge at the a justice at the Supreme Court refuses to recuse himself, what are your options? The Supreme Court is the last stop on the judicial road. So there's really no appeal from a recusal denial at the Supreme Court. So that gives you an idea of how important the job is. And in a case like this, look, judges are political creatures. They're involved in things. They obviously are usually a member of one political party or another. But this is different. This is a spouse. It's the relationship that is the most private, the most uh, intimate of relationships in society. And so you right. have to believe that it creates maybe not impropriety, but the appearance of impropriety. And when you look at the rules of ethics for lawyers and judges alike, it's not always whether or not there was actually something improper done. It's the mere appearance of impropriety threatens the impartiality of the judicial system. Before I got to let you go, uh, Danny, we have an update from the January 6th committee. Tonight, Congress was deciding whether or not to hold two of the president's aides, Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino, in contempt of Congress. And they have recommended charges that they both be held in contempt of Congress. Danny, explain what that would mean and how that factors into the committee's investigation, holding the two of them in contempt. The contempt of Congress is a unique criminal animal because it, it begins in a totally different way than most crimes do at the federal and, and, of course, at the state level. At this point now, it goes to the House, and if the House approves it, it goes to the uh, Department of Justice. But the Department of Justice is not an automaton. Uh, the Department of Justice can in exercise its independent judgment as to whether or not to bring charges. So, again, not only is it political in Congress, there's a second level when it gets to the DOJ that it is additionally political uh, because the DOJ is, is itself a political creature. Uh, of course, it works to justice, but they're going to have to make a decision whether or not they're going to go forward with charges in this case. Uh, that's why contempt of Congress is rather a unique and maybe even odd little crime because it doesn't follow all the rules that uh, most other crimes and criminal justice does. And last 10 seconds, Danny, if you are found guilty of contempt of Congress, what's the punishment? It has, it care, it's not decades in prison, but it is uh, potential jail time for, uh, for contempt of Congress. It is a federal crime, and really all federal crimes are serious because they almost always carry some form of incarceration as a potential sentence. Gotcha. Thank you, Danny. That's NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos with us tonight. Also today, President Biden unveiled his proposed budget for the 2023 fiscal year, and he included something that many of his progressive supporters have been hoping for, what you might call a billionaire's tax. Just pay your fair share. Pay a little bit. A firefighter and a teacher pay more than double, double the tax rate that a billionaire pays. That's not right. That's not fair. 
and my budget contains a billionaire minimum tax because of that. A 20 percent minimum tax that applies only to the top one hundredth of one percent, one hundredth of one percent of the Americans will pay this tax. The billionaire minimum tax is fair, and it raises $360 billion that can be used at lower cost for families and cut the deficit. That was the president speaking today. Let's get more now from NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Hey, Mike. Well, Joshua, you know, there's an old expression in Washington as it relates to a president's budget, which is the White House proposes and Congress disposes. And so we know, uh, as the president today introduces a $5.8 trillion budget proposal for the next fiscal year, the Congress is going to have its own say here, and all the president's priorities are unlikely to see the finish line. But as the president himself put it, a uh, budget is more than that. It's a statement of priorities. It's a statement of values, especially important in an election year. And so the president really broke down this proposal into three separate categories. Interestingly, the first one, fiscal responsibility. The president making the point that this year's budget deficit is projected to be $1.3 trillion less than the year before. And in fact, it's even uh, less than now half of what the budget deficit was that he inherited from his predecessor. The president today doing something he doesn't do often, which is actually invoking what he called the Trump deficits that he inherited. Now, part of the budget proposal from the president today to continue deficit reduction for the next 10 years is the introduction of what he's calling a billionaire's minimum income tax. That would essentially treat investment income for the uber wealthy. We're talking about 0.01 percent of Americans, the same as traditional sources of income, requiring them to pay up to 20 percent of that income uh, as tax. Now, the second category the president today talked about, which is security at home and security abroad. The president proposing $800 billion in terms of defense spending, an increase driven largely because of the situation in Ukraine, the efforts on the part of the U.S. to support our NATO allies as well as Ukraine. The second is a $30 billion funding for law enforcement and the Justice Department, crime prevention strategies that really put the president on the record, further establishing distance between the defund the police movement by calling for an increase in funding here. And then the last category, the president calls it building a new America. This is what we would used to call build back better. The White House still holding out hopes that the president can get some of his domestic priorities through, including things like universal child care, pre-K, uh, including the Medicare being able to negotiate the prices of prescription drugs. The president reiterating his call uh, for those priorities in his address today. Now, as the House Budget Committee Chairman John Yarmuth said, he saw this as a budget proposal aimed at one person, Joe Manchin. The White House indicating, yes, they still have hope of seeing some of these proposals through, but as we know, it's a long way ahead. Joshua. Thank you, Mike. That's NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli reporting. In Florida, the controversial education measure that critics call the Don't Say Gay bill is now law. Governor Ron DeSantis signed it today. Now, that bill is actually called the Parental Rights in Education Act. It prohibits classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in public schools. It also lets parents sue schools if they believe such a conversation is not age appropriate. Governor DeSantis is running for re-election in addition to being widely considered a potential Republican presidential candidate. Soon after the signing, a statement from the Walt Disney Company said that it would fight the measure. The governor said that opposition did not phase him. We will continue to recognize that in the state of Florida, parents have a fundamental role in the education, health care, and well-being of their children. We will not move from that. I don't care what corporate media outlets say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what big corporations say. Here I stand. I'm not backing down. A statement from Education Secretary Miguel Cardona reads in part, quote, we will be monitoring this law upon implementation to evaluate whether it violates federal civil rights law, unquote. And as for that implementation, the bill is set to take effect during summer break on July 1st. Just ahead, the Oscars. There were plenty of firsts in addition to that shocking moment that everyone's been talking about. We'll get into all of it before we go. So did you catch the Oscars last night? A lot more happened than just the slap. They actually gave out awards. 
including some that made Hollywood history. Ariana DeBose won the first award of the night for her supporting role in West Side Story. She's the first openly queer Afro-Latina to win an acting Oscar. Jane Campion won Best Director for the film The Power of the Dog. She's the first woman nominated for this award twice. Troy Kotzer won an Oscar for his supporting role in CODA. He's the first deaf man to win an Academy Award in acting, and he took the stage again when CODA won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Ricky Pointer, a deaf YouTuber, writer, and accessibility expert, and helping us out tonight is interpreter Felicia Williams. Welcome to you both. Good to have you with us. And Ricky, I wonder if we could start, first of all, if you would just tell me what you thought of CODA and whether you felt that it accurately portrayed parts of the deaf community. Hi. Thank you for having me. First of all, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so CODA's, CODA's been interesting. Um, overall, I did like the movie. Uh, you know, I have my friend in it. I, I know Daniel personally, so I might be a little bit biased in that regard. And I have, uh, you know, really big respect for Troy and Miley. In terms of representation, I mean, obviously, you know, the fact that we have three actual deaf people who actually sign, you know, in the movie. That's really, really great, especially when you've heard about the fact that um, originally I think they wanted a hearing man to play Troy, like they would act as a deaf man, but mine was like, no, we can't have that. So uh, that made me feel really good. Um, I think there were some parts I can't really remember entirely specifically. Um, I think one of the things was just the whole fight when in regards to like trying to get accessibility. So like, for example, when they're at the doctor's, you know, they, they seem to be a little bit laxed in that scene when right. they just have their daughter interpret for them. But I also realize that in really, really small towns, that tends to be um, very, what's, what's the word that I'm looking for? I have a little bit of brain fog going right now. It does tend to be normal, which is not necessarily a good thing, but it does happen. But the one thing that I really, really liked, uh, the scene when they're, uh, when the dad and the mom are pulling up at school in that truck and the music is going really, really loud. Um, as someone who also has their music uh, uh, very max volume, uh, I really, really relate to that very much. So. What are some of the things that hearing people need to understand about the deaf community through this film? I think, for example, even just the term CODA, a child of deaf adults, is something worth knowing. Also, the fact that you are both deaf and verbal, speaking with the help of an interpreter, but also verbalizing that's something that maybe hearing people might not expect or might not think about. Yeah, I sometimes I not sometimes I think all the time people do tend to get confused when they're like, oh, wait, so you're talking, right? Uh, yeah, so I uh, let's see, what's the one I'm looking at? Right. So I, did, I grew up as a mainstream deaf person and went through like public schooling and things like that. Like I didn't grow up with I did not grow up with. ASL. So, you know, I've been learning that and using that for the last couple of years, but English is my first and my native language. So it's just easier for me, especially in things like this, to use English just so I can make sure that my thoughts are across, especially when I'm very nervous. So I just got to make sure that uh, my words come out the way that I want them to. But yeah, being deaf is, you know, not just one size fits all. Like some of us will grow up speaking only or signing only, or sometimes it's a mixture of both. And you're, whoever you meet is very likely gonna be different from the next one and not everybody has the same uh, communication needs or communication styles, accessibility needs, things like that. Like, we're not a monolith. We have a lot of similarities together, but you know, like just like any other community, we're, we do have our differences. Before I have to let you go, you mentioned that the deaf community is not a monolith. That is well said. And I think maybe some people are thinking more about accessibility. What's the one biggest thing that you would like to see more of or see different to make this country, to make this world more accessible for deaf and hard of hearing people? Oh, God, that's so hard to say. Because I think the biggest thing that I could say is that I've always, it, it sounds weird to some people that I'm going to say this, maybe, but accessibility is never going to be 100%. Like, nothing is ever going to be 100% accessible, and accessibility is not perfect because every person, like, even if you had two deaf people together, right? So you have me and, like, I don't know, insert my friend here, right? We would have, like, different 
maybe captioning needs in a way that that looks, you know, like certain sizes, font styles, things like that, like deaf people and deaf blind people would have different accessibility needs. So I think in regards to accessibility, is the best thing, in my opinion, would be to listen to the person that does need that accessibility and ask them what they need and do your best to be able to provide that and just don't fight them on it, basically. Because that's something that tends to happen a lot is that like if I'm asking for something in terms of accessibility, sometimes I will get like fought back on it and they'll be like, okay, but do you really need that though? Or so-and-so didn't need this. But I'll be like, well, that's them. This is me. Right. Ricky Pointer with interpreter Felicia Williams. I appreciate you both making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go, we would love to hear from you about the slap. But hear me out first. Last night's incident got me thinking about free speech and the First Amendment. If it's okay to slap a comedian, then what does that mean for me as a journalist? What if someone decided to come after me for reporting something they despise? The First Amendment protects speech even if you hate it. It even protects hate speech. The risks of what we say may be professional, but rarely are they physical. Last night online, some of you focused on Jada Pinkett Smith's medical condition, alopecia. Others empathized with Will Smith as a partner standing up for his woman. Still others called it toxic masculinity incarnate. To be fair, a few of you said you didn't really care and we should just focus on Ukraine instead. So, yes, we have to talk about the slap. But not tonight. Not with this many options to focus on. Let's get past the hot takes and go deeper. For starters, I'd like to know how folks around you are talking about this now. So tell us, what is the best conversation you've had about the incident at the Oscars? Who did you talk to and what did you learn? Share your story with us. We are at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. I'd also love to know how people in different parts of the world are talking about it. The best conversation you had about the incident at the Oscars. Who did you talk to and what did you learn? You can also email us now tonight at NBCNews.com and we will share some of your stories tomorrow. I cannot wait to continue this conversation with you, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.